Hi, it's mailbag time and in Mickle Repair today we've got quite a large pile of it. It's been a good month or two since I last did a mailbag and I seem to have accumulated a fair bit. A couple of exciting big parcels, but first of all I'll get started on some of these. And I'm going to get started on these three flat parcels to begin with because I know what these are and uh, they're from a liquidation sale. So uh, they're pretty much all the same thing. Let's get started. So let's see if I can figure out how to get into this. Yep, I think we're looking, and here we have them. So yes, indeed, these are a fairly large pile of electrolytic capacitors. So these are one microfarad, 100 volt capacitors, and uh, yep. Definitely one microfarad, we'll 100 volts. That's excellent. So that's that pile. This, as I say, is going to be something very similar. So here we go. Just another load of capacitors. These are so these are 2.2 microfarad, 100 volt Nichicon capacitors, and uh, yeah, quite nice capacitors again from that same liquidation sale. And of course, finally. The last packet is going to be more capacitors, just in case you hadn't guessed. A rather different style though this time. Uh, little uh, film capacitors, so uh, yeah, so nice. I don't actually stock that many film capacitors, so uh, now I do. And uh, yes, it contains a pair of glasses. So I wasn't going to hold this back for the... Uh, Thing, but uh, but so what's special about these glasses? Well, they're kind of like reading glasses, but they're not. These are actually magnifiers, and they are uh, 1.3 times magnification at my normal working distance. So these were made specifically by my optician for me to enable me to work in the lab, sitting at my bench without having to uh, to do this to see things. So these work at, uh, at normal hand arm distance and they do magnify just a little bit, not a huge amount. So hopefully they will come in pretty handy. So I have bought off the shelf ones before but the focal distance is always too short. I always end up sort of uh, having to lift things right up to my face to, uh, to work. Whereas these focus at about two feet. I don't remember what's in this one. Some I can remember, some I can't. What's in here? It looks like... Oh yes, okay, I remember now. There we go, so it's one of those little testers. So the reason I bought this is I've had one for quite a while and I don't actually use it that often. Let's see if I can just find a battery to plug into it for a second. No, we're okay, good. So I wanted this the other day so I could test uh, on this little pad here with some surface mount uh, FETs that I was uh, doing repair with. And I just wanted to do a quick test on them, just check their polarity and that sort of stuff. And uh, yeah, my device had completely failed. And uh, yeah, lights on it was and, uh, and no one at home, unfortunately. So I decided I would just pick another one up, just the same as the last one that I had. This one, I have to be honest, has been manufactured considerably worse. But, uh, you know, it does, the, it does the job. It's not the same as a true measurement device, but kind of handy to just have one of these around from time to time. And for, I think, £8 that I paid for it, I'm not going to argue too much. So there we have it. We've got a bunch of resistors. So these are panel-mounted resistors. This one is 100 watts at 4 ohms. As is this one, this one, and this one. So I'm going to use these to make a switchable stereo load for when I want to test audio amplifiers and that sort of stuff. So essentially these will be able to go in parallel for 2 ohms, in series to make 8 ohms, or just one at a time to make a 4 ohm loudspeaker connection. So uh, I did think about putting some more resistors in there, but they're a bit pricey. They're not, they're not 
expensive expensive but uh, they're expensive enough that you don't really want to buy a whole load of them but anyway there we go uh, nice simple connections and these will go in a box and they'll be mounted on a heat sink um, with a, a thermally activated fan to go across so that'll be a very very simple little build but, uh, but quite effective and to simulate the loudspeaker I might also um, put a little bit of an inductive low resistance but inductive winding in front just to give a slightly more speaker-like characteristic. So here we've got a very short HDMI cable uh, and the reason for that is that uh, I wanted a short cable to go off the back of my microscope. The current cable is, is far too long and the other thing that I wanted to go off the back of the microscope was this. So my microscope has uh, 1080p HDMI output and no USB output at all. Now this is really good news in some ways because there's no latency, I can put it straight onto a screen and uh, there's no delay between me moving my soldering iron in, for example, my solder in from the opposite direction and the microscope showing exactly what I'm doing on the screen. With some of the cheaper USB cameras, there was a huge sort of delay with that going on. But on the other hand, without USB, that means I can't do things like um, using my microscope for detailed measurements and things like that. Uh, and also I can't do any digital, I mean, I can do kind of like sharpness and contrast and stuff, but I can't do any digital manipulation very easily. I kind of have to push that HDMI through to my video capture system, capture that video, and then translate it into a picture. And all of this is, is although it's digital, uh, we still have compression losses and things like that going on. So it's far better if I can put it through one of these. This has an HDMI input. And this particular one has an HDMI output as well. And that's why I chose it, because it has a pass-through for the HDMI. So this is just goes in my current HDMI cable. This very short cable, daisy chains it onto my microscope. And at the other end comes my USB 3 to my computer. So that's uh, what that's for. Essentially, so that I can get my microscope working both as a USB microscope and a latency-free or minimal latency HDMI, so it's very usable still, but at the same time I can capture and measure and do digital manipulation on the screen. This one has batteries in it apparently. Oh yes, I think I know what this is, if I recall correctly. This is an anemometer. Let's get the words right. And uh, I actually do have an anemometer already, um, but it's got a quite a large sort of uh, wind De detection system. So I decided I would pick this one up because it's small. So yeah, there's, uh, it's very cheap, obviously. This particular one, I think it was uh, 12 pounds, less some discount, but very sensitive to airflow. I mean, I can just lightly blow on that and the blades are spinning around like mad. Whoops. I'm guessing it goes in that way. And hopefully we can see that. So currently we've got meters per second as our speed indicator. We've got centigrade 22.3 in the lab. And even a fairly gentle breathe on that and we're able to uh, read that. So one of the things that I want to use this for is for when I'm doing things like fan replacements in test gear and things like that. So often the test gear have very noisy fans with worn out bearings, that sort of stuff. And I want to put something quieter in there, but I don't know the spec of the fan. Or I want to actually put a fan in that's similar in size, but it's going to have greater throughput. Something along those lines. Maybe um, just replace a noisy fan with a quiet one. And it's useful to be able to have a small unit like this that you can put in a strategic point of the airflow. So this, for example, I'll be able to put on a circuit board on its side. And, uh, and actually next to, for example, the heat sink on a processor or something like that. And uh, yeah, and that'll, uh, that'll do the job. I just need to attach this little lanyard to it. But uh, anyway, that will come in quite handy. And set, obviously, is the on off button. Yeah, cool. Still. 
old broken test equipment or reclaimed test equipment from a factory or along those lines. Two. Three pieces. There's more, there's more. Something else, I've no idea what, what that was. Don't recall seeing that in the uh, listing. So there should be four of the same and then one different device here. So let's uh, quickly get one open. And I've no idea what this is, no idea. I can have a guess. But, uh, okay, there we have it. So it's an SD9100V uh, with a dodgy power switch by the looks of it in this instance. So these are all spares or repair type stuff. Let me put it up this way so you can kind of see it in this view. So what is this? Well, this essentially is used for dispensing liquids and pastes and paints and things like that accurately. So we were able to set the pressure of dispensing so they're used with things like syringes and uh, pneumatic paint brushes that sort of stuff so this knob here essentially is going to adjust how long it dispenses for this is an air output that's going to go to our device this is a little vacuum adjust uh, which i need to have a little play with so we have an air inlet on the back just here and we've got a switch just here and we've got an exhaust port just here and a power switch of course well, essentially we have compressed air coming in and we can read it on here we can set our flow rate or, or pressure just here and uh, dial in what we want to be delivered through this port here to our injection gun or syringe or whatever it is that we're using um, and then basically we press our little trigger or foot pedal or whatever it is we're using to control it and the end result of that is uh, a set amount, an accurate amount of liquid dispensed time after time after time. Let's just see if we've got a few spares and useful bits and pieces here. Oh, okay. So this bag basically just contains, um, so we can see this is a pressure device. This is a similar one, only it's got a couple of adapters on it and things like that. We've got some knobs for the front panel. And we've got an air uh, intake or outlet. Not sure which way um, that is. It might be a pressure relief valve that. But anyway, whatever it is, it doesn't matter that much. So here's a slightly more complete one by the looks of it. There we go. So we look at the back here. Yeah, ACC air, air in. There's our switch. Here's our exhaust. And then we've got a full set of controls and etc. on the front. So we've got a vacuum control over here. So why do we need a vacuum control? Well, if you imagine, for example, you've got a syringe on here connected to this. Here, we've just put pressurised air in it to dispense. As soon as we finish dispensing, we need to actually stop any sort of drip or any nastiness coming at the end of that. So we need to actually apply a small backward pressure on that. We need to reduce the pressure just below atmospheric pressure, just so that we just draw back whatever's on the tip. Um, but we don't want to draw it back hugely because obviously we don't want to suck off whatever we've just dispensed. So my intention is to use a cheap CNC machine. So one of those very cheap sort of hundred pound jobs off eBay, which is just basically two axes and an up down for a motor, replace the motor with a syringe. And then this will actually dispense um, computer controlled dispensing of solder paste onto my circuit boards. And the reason for that is that I normally get one of these when I order a PCB. And this is a stencil. Hopefully we can see that fairly clearly. It's made of stainless steel. And into it, they have cut all the, all the pads and where solder is going to be. And you squeegee solder through this onto the board. The problem with this is that you can end up, I mean, this, for example, the board for this is two inches by three inches, I think, that this is going onto, including its holes around the edges. And a pack of five of them, uh, I think it's a four layer board, and a pack of five of them probably cost me three pounds. 
and probably four pound for delivery from China. Add this stainless steel, and uh, this is the smallest they make it, which is very large. And the two pieces of wood that they pack it with, and all of a sudden, your eight pound order suddenly starts looking like 20, 23, 24 pounds. And uh, so I think for some of the smaller prototyping and things like that, it'd be really good if I can uh, dispense my solder using a CNC dispenser. And for that though, I do need to be able to accurately control the amount of solder that's dispensed on each little dot, so to speak. Let's open this one up and just see what it's like on the inside. Hopefully this one, even if it doesn't work, we'll have a full set of components so we stand some chance with it. Okay, so we can see that uh, our vacuum control, it's very hard to see where all the, <laughs> all the wires go, but, uh, all the, but the pipe goes around here, across, to this control just here. It then comes out of this control just here and goes across to this control just here, across to there and out to this output exhaust port. Now the other place that it goes, comes in there and goes across to this accessory port here so you can connect other things to it, should you wish. And I think that's probably got an over, over pressure valve on it at the moment. And the other place that we're mainly going to then is back from here. So this is like a Venturi type thing. So some of is leaking out of here and uh, that can cause some low pressure if we need it. And we go across to here and out through this solenoid and over to the output port. So I've never used it yet. I've never tried it. So we've got on and we've got timed. But down here as a, it's just, we've got a transformer, some rectifiers, and uh, we're just shoving out some voltage into this. I think this will be a CMOS timer chip. This goes across to here. This is a Darlington transistor, and its job is basically just to uh, drive this uh, 24 volt, 24 volt, five watt solenoid. Uh, and that's managing the air pressure switch just here. And that's all it's got really. So I think that this is choosing whether we output air to there or whether or not we are pushing our air through and out the other way. So uh, yeah, quite nice. So made by Semco, who still make the devices like this. And also they make all the accessories like the syringes and paintbrushes and things like that that you may wish to use. So if you look something that's been hand painted from a factory, there's likely to be something of this nature providing the feed to that to actually dispense paint or glue or anything like that at a constant rate. Let's get this one reassembled. So I have four of these in total. So that one is in a fairly good state of repair. I'm not gonna open these other two up on screen, but uh, so we've got a very badly sort of uh, cannibalized one just here. We've got one that appears to be complete and uh, stands a chance of working, I would think, just here. Even if it doesn't work, it's not exactly gonna be challenging to repair. And then there's another two just here. And not quite complete because we're missing an air intake valve just here. But probably not too bad. And this one says it's got an air leak inside. So again, it's got some what looks like potting compounds and things like that on it. And uh, yeah, I'm sure we can trace down the air leak without too much trouble. These look very old and yellowed. So this is a more comprehensive one. It's the same sort of thing. If we take a look at the top though, you want to state that's in. It, uh, all of its potting compounds and things all over it. But it's the same basic working principle. We've just got more timed outputs and some maximum minimum shots and things like that. So I'm gonna to have to find the operating instructions for this one because there's clearly quite a bit more going on on this one here. 
this one here as well. It has a different type of air inlet connector, which actually might fit my normal compressor, connecting quite easily. And we've got that air output as well there, should we want to use it. And a different type of connector for the foot switch. It doesn't have to be a foot switch, so some syringes come with a little button on them. You just uh, put the syringe in place and press the button. So pretty much my hope is to get these two working. These are in pretty decent condition and this bottom one working, although I might need to make a new lid for it because it's in such a horrible state. And so to our last box, which hopefully contains more traditional type gear. So interesting, once again, I thought this box contained two units, but we seem to have an extra unit just here. So let's uh, find out what that is, first of all. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. So uh, this is the insides from one of them. So uh, in the advert, it did say that the power supply in one of them was uh, knackered. And uh, I think I can agree with that. Here is the transformer that has literally been ripped apart, presumably by being moved around at some point. The question is whether I can work out what that transformer is and whether it's fairly standard or not. But yeah, that board is a bit terminal if I can't get a, just a drop-in replacement transformer. So just a bit, one, two, three, four bridge rectifiers and some, uh, Yeah, linear regulators across the back here. So that's all that there is on that power supply. So in actual fact, I can probably work out an appropriate transformer that can drop in there. So I know one of these units is gonna be a lot lighter than the other. If that looks like a piece of test gear, you're not wrong. I'd rather say that that's lab equipment rather than test gear, but... Uh... Okay, given how much this is rattling, I'm guessing this is the one with the missing pieces. Yeah, dead, broken transformer. That gives a bit of a giveaway, that. So what are these? Well, there you go. These are, this is an ILX Lightwave LDT5910 temperature controller. And this is essentially the same, except it's the uh, 5910 Model B temperature controller. The main, well, apart from the precision, the main difference between these two things are the sensors that you can use. Um, just normal thermistors and calibrate for them, despite the fact they're non-linear in nature. And also it can use some other types of sensing device. So I'm not sure if that's clear on there. Um, so we can use a AD590 series, an LM335 series, or we can use um, some thermistors. And we can also set the current that we're going to use for driving those components on here as well, which helps us control um, the self-heating of them. And uh, yeah, so that goes to the thermistor and, uh, and this goes to the temperature module. So essentially this is uh, turning on or off cooling rather than heating, but it is a proportional signal uh, and it's bipolar. So we can either heat up or we can cool things down. And you would use this generally for things like uh, lasers and that sort of thing in order to uh, to manage the cooling system. So we will set our uh, temperature that we want by pressing the set temperature button and, uh, and go from there. So apparently this one has got a, a totally destroyed transformer unit, which is here. Uh, and this other one, the latent model, just doesn't power on. So I'm not too worried about that. I'll be doing a, a repair video, I guess, on this and hopefully getting this one at least up and running. So I'm going to open up this one that's already very badly in very bad condition and yeah we can actually see if we look at this back edge that it has a dent here so it's clearly been dropped by someone. GPIB is also floating around. So someone's dropped this, taken it apart to see what's going wrong with it and discovered a very very nasty mess I think. Even if I don't use it for anything else this is a really conveniently sized case. There's my comms board. There's my main board down there, not too concerned about that. Yeah, I think I'm pretty well lit here. Got a normal power switch down here. 
Let me put my new glasses on, then I'll be able to see what I'm doing. Okay, so two more pumps. I don't know what that device is. Precision trims resistor here, some more pumps, more pumps. Filtered input. This is clearly going off to our power board. ICL 7109, so I'm guessing, hmm. M82C558-5. And some EEPROM and uh, I'm guessing that this one just here is just some normal RAM. And yeah, there's not a lot else in here to be honest. There's a crystal and a few other things. So I'm not thinking too bad. The only worry is that something like one of these pieces is faulty. What is that? It's a DG212. So I'm mm, not sure how easy they are to get hold of off the top of my head. Over this side, we've got some 7.4 logic. But uh, yeah, fairly straightforward. And uh, as I say, this is our GPIB board just sitting here as a separate unit in its own right. Now, even if I can't really get this one up and running again, then it's actually going to make quite a nice uh, case because this is uh, just a, uh, a separatable front plate. And uh, yeah, nice actual physical size for a little desktop instrument should I decide to uh, to make one in the future. This one of course is very much more complete. We have all of our feet, all of our connectors, everything is uh, is intact on this one. And yeah, pretty happy with the with the looks of that, but as it says, I believe it's dead on power up. I'll just give it a quick uh, run up just to uh, verify that. Yeah, nothing there at all. And uh, yeah, that doesn't uh, doesn't worry me particularly. Looking at the design of the other one, this is a fairly rudimentary power supply, and uh, and also main circuit as well. So yeah, cool. So there we have them, two pieces of uh, lab equipment. Fingers crossed. But anyway, taking these apart and repairing them is going to be for a different video. So in the meantime, I hope you've enjoyed this mailbag. If so, don't forget to uh, thumbs up. And of course, subscribe if you haven't already done so. Take care. I'll see you soon. Bye for now.